We're here on December 28th, 2012 with Evelyn Litz. Please say your name and spell it. Evelyn Litz, E-V-E-L-Y-N-E-L-I-T-C. So where are you from originally? Chicago. And how did you become involved with the Manhattan Project? Well, after we were married, um, Hmm. Uh, we we had a job in, uh, in in Alabama, and we decided we'd look for something else, and we came back to Chicago to be with the family. In those days, a man had to be out of work for 30 days so that the um, draft board could catch him if they wanted him. So we were out for those 30 days. and. We looked for a job in, in California. Larry uh, found an old friend from the university and he asked Larry uh, to work there. How did you meet your husband? Sweetheart, this is, this is really terrible. We were 17 at the time, just starting college. You really don't want to know this. Okay. <laughs> it, it's such a long story. Okay. Um, what, did you... Um, we were at college together. Where, where did you go to college? Right, junior college. What did you study there? Art, history, and language. So you were an artist? Right. Um, and a librarian. Loved books all my life. Always worked as a volunteer in the library. And um, what kind of a job did your husband have in Chicago? Well, he started working for Fermi under the grandstand. Didn't tell, couldn't tell me anything about it except he was very excited and very happy about it. And then one day he came home, and I think this was at the University of Chicago, and uh, something happened that, that was quite interesting and all the physicists were betting on a certain time that something would go radioactive or whatever. And they all put money in a pile, and Larry won, Larry won the money. So Larry had the most accurate guess. <laughs> yes, he did. So he, he won a lot of money then. It wasn't much, honey. Okay. But it was fun. Did you ever get to meet Enrico Fermi? I met him at Los Alamos, yes. Okay. Um, did you know any of the other scientists at Chicago? No. So how did you end up, how did you and your husband end up going from Chicago to Los Alamos? Larry was working there only a few months, and they transferred him to Los Alamos. Um, how did you react when he told you that you that you had to move to New Mexico? Loved it. You were excited to Always move? Always an adventure, absolutely. Did he tell you why um, you needed to move? No, only it was important and that he was working for the war effort. And you were fine with that? Absolutely. Um, what, you came to Los Alamos on the train? I will never forget that day. They let us off, and there, there was no station. There was hot, blazing sun, and we sat there for, it seemed, hours. Everybody left, and we're sitting there with our little dog and our few wedding presents and um, our luggage. And finally, someone came up to Larry and said, I think I remember you from the Rad Lab. And that was the beginning of our trip up to Los Alamos. What did you think when you first arrived in, in, in New Mexico and, and Los Alamos and saw the landscape? I thought it was very dreary. And the road up to Los Alamos was disaster. It was so narrow. Hardly two cars could pass by. And if, if one car was going down, the one closest to the inside of the hill kind of scrounged against the hill. It, it was a terrible road, terrible road. What was the housing like at Los Alamos? Well, when we first got there, we had this adorable little one-bedroom house, and they gave us furniture. You know what? I'm trying to remember if we paid $35 a month rent. I'm not sure. I have to check that out. Anyway, um, in, in the kitchen there was... <clears throat> a, a, a little two-burner 
a stove and, and one burner had a big square on it so you could bake in it. And um, the reason I mention it is because when they found out I was pregnant, they gave us a two bedroom house. And when we walked in the kitchen, there was a wood burning stove, one of these big old wood burning stoves and the wood was outside. Well, for a Chicago girl, this was quite a challenge. And I was working. And I remember that I had to go and see the head of the project. I want to say it might have been Parsons. I can't remember. In order to get back my little two, bur uh, two burner electric thing. And you got it back. I got it back. What were other challenges at, of life at Los Alamos? Were there any issues with the food rations? It seemed to me the food was rationed. I cannot remember the commissary for the life of me. I have really tried. I cannot visualize it, but I think, I think the food was rationed. But you know, you lived with it. It was wartime. Did you have any job while you were at Los Alamos? Oh, we brought up our little puppy. The first time we went down to Santa Fe, we came back and uh, we had someone walk him during the day, but we came back at night. And he'd taken every shoe out of the closet and he'd taken the, the toilet paper from one room and spread it all over the living room. Later on, I don't know whether it was a year or so later, he was such a, a darling little dog. He used to sit near the road in front of our house and the wax would come down the road to go to their barracks and everybody just loved Pal. They'd all hug him and kiss him. And uh, one day he, we were in the house and he, 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 he stopped breathing. He was dead. Aww. And we, Larry grabbed him in his arms and we ran up to the, um, the hospital. And it wasn't that far from our house. And they saw us coming and there was a nurse there with a syringe. I don't know what it, they were going to do. Anyway, we had to leave the dog there. And the dog had to be autopsy because it was a suspicious death. And it turned out that somebody had put rat poison outside for what reason, I don't know. And he must have gotten the rat poison and died. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. Um, now, did you have, you mentioned you had a child when you were at Los Alamos. Right. It was very interesting because we were, Wednesday nights when Oppenheimer would speak, there was a group of wives who had nothing to do. So eventually we gathered together, first there was two, then there was four. We must have wound up about 16 wives. and. There were physicists, chemists, every every kind of wife, of a, a scientist you can imagine, and we all had babies. And Wednesday night became the night when you announced you were going to have a baby. So uh, sometimes you were ready to announce, and somebody got there ahead of you, you know. So you waited for the next week or so. <laughs> and. Um, we did have our, our first daughter up there. And what was that experience like? I cannot tell you how wonderfully we were treated. I think we were in the hospital room for 12 days. I think we dangled our legs. You know, this is hilarious considering today you're up and out the second day. Uh, I think the third day we dangled our feet over the bed and the babies were in the room with us. We, we just had the most wonderful care. After the baby was born, I remember somehow um, I had help in the house and she was an Indian lady and she was an Indian princess. Oh. And she helped me for a week. She told me she was a princess. And uh, when she left, we had become good friends. And she left a little silver pin with a turquoise in it for my daughter. Did you have any other interactions with Indians or Pueblos while no, you were in New Mexico? No, I did not. Okay. No. Um, so did your daughter 
on her birth certificate, does it have, what, what does it list as her birthplace? 1663 Sandoval County, all her life, yeah. And, and that's what, that was typical for all the children that Absolutely. were in there. Absolutely. And I have to tell you what was really funny was the physicists all had boys. And the chemists and other scientists all had girls. <laughs> Out of maybe 16 of us, it was, it was really a joke. And um, d um, so what other special treatment did you get once you had a child? Um, did you get extra food? I don't remember any of that. Okay. Um, now, were, were you able to correspond with friends or relatives and tell them where you were? No, never, never. In fact, I know that when I called my parents to tell them I was pregnant, it was censored on the telephone. How do you know that? What, what, what was censored? I, I can't remember, but I remember somebody said, don't answer that. Hmm. So I, I knew it was censored. I had a wonderful time working up there. So, um, so your, your family didn't know where you were? They no. just knew, did they know that you and your husband were involved in the war effort? No. So you weren't allowed to tell them anything at all? I'm sure they surmised it. Uh, there was no, you know, what what other thing would keep Larry up there, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so were you able to write letters knowing that, but, knew that, but you knew that they would be censored? No. Um, so you had mentioned to me before that you felt like Los Alamos was like a family the community there. It, it was definitely like a family and when you work there at the labs it was definitely like a family. The, jo the job I had originally was in health physics and they, they were primarily concerned with the health of everybody there. The, the scientists were uh, given uh, urine bottles uh, very frequently to fill, blood tests were taken. We had uh, badges that would show radioactivity. The men wore, everybody who entered the laboratory, D building where we worked, wore booties. I worked for a very interesting man, a very dedicated man, I think his name was Dr. Popham. And he was English, and every so often we'd have tea in the afternoon. So what kind of work then did you do for health physics? Were you monitoring people? I monitored the laboratories especially. Uh, there were special uh, little discs that we used, and uh, we'd take dust samples and then put them on a Geiger counter. And if there was any problem, we had a group of men ready and able to decontaminate. How did you get that job? I went and applied for it. Even though you had an artist's background? Right. They, they didn't care about that? No. I could do that. And I had a very extensive library background. And uh, one day um, I was replaced by two GIs because there was a need in the catalog room. So I became head of the catalog room. And what did you do there? Mostly filing, you know, whatever, um, the way you do in a regular library with books on the shelf. There were thousands. You cannot imagine the size of this catalog room. It was gigantic for me. It, it wasn't probably for a lot of people, but I thought at the time for a catalog room, it was gigantic. And people came from every part of the uh, the the Mesa, whatever research they needed, if they needed catalogs, I was the librarian. So it was mostly scientific work that was in the library? I think that every part of every, it was so extensive, so well put together, that every spare part that they needed for any kind of instrument, the catalog was up on the shelf. It, it, it was... It, it, it was uh, very intensive. It, it wasn't just for radioactive material, anything like that. It was for every type of equipment that was used anywhere. Um, did you have any especially funny or odd requests that you remember getting as, at the library? Well, 
I remember one pretty funny one at, 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 the, uh, at the other job at Health Physics. You'll probably delete this, but um, one of the prettiest women on the Mesa was Marilyn McChesney. She, she was young, she, early 20s probably, big bow in the back of her head, V-neck. She was part of Health Physics. And I remember one day this Nobel Prize winner, I was in the room, came in and she was taking a blood test and she missed it the first time, the, the needle in the vein. And she said, oh, I missed it. Oh, I'm so sorry. And he looked up and he said, that's all right, honey. That's about the funniest. <laughs> Do you remember who, which scientist it was who said that? No, I can't remember. I remember he was kind of short. <laughs> Well, there are a lot of Nobel Prize winning oh, scientists at Los Alamos. Um, we had some wonderful neighbors, and uh, I, I remember when the Tucks came over from England, um, talk about Nobel, he, he later be, became a, a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, we all admired her coat. Well, we had never met during the war someone from England and she was telling me how terrible the rationing was in England and she said please don't ever look at my underwear and you see this gorgeous coat you're admiring well this is my family rug and the family had made it into a coat for her to take to America and, and Tuck himself was uh, I can't remember his first name at all he, he said he, he loved coming over because, not only the work, but in England he couldn't hunt, and here he could hunt, and so he was looking forward to that. Um, you, and your husband mentioned that Richard Feynman was one of your neighbors? He was, for a short time, uh, while, he's, while his wife was in the hospital. I think she died of tuberculosis there. And for a short time, while he was in the while she was in the hospital, he was our neighbor. So, did you have much interaction with him? Not much. What did other? He, I'm sorry. What other scientists did you get to know well? Oh, well, there's some names I can't remember suddenly. Um, Hmm. I'm, uh, do you have my notes at all? Sure. Um. We, we, were we were close to several, several good people. Did, um, d did you know Robert Oppenheimer at all? Or he no he was close? not, no, Larry knew him. I did not know him. I met him several times. I did not know him. I did not know him. Um. Uh, I hear, see here in your notes, you say Gene Lorenz, was he at Los Alamos? No, he wasn't. This is an interesting thing. And I think one of the biggest things that we came away from the war was after the war, Larry would speak at different places where he was invited to speak. And he, he talked about the atomic bomb and our part of it. And men came up to him by the hundreds, ex-servicemen who just shook his hand and said, thank you. We, we thought we were, we were going to die. And Jean Lorenz is one of our great friends here. And last year, he brought one of the biggest doctors from Mayo Clinic here. And he had told his friend, they're both in their 50s, I guess, that, that he knew Larry, and this, this doctor told his father. And the father said to uh, this doctor, what, please go there and give Larry a hug for me, because I was leaving France, on, and I thought I was never going to live to see the day. So this, this is one of the greatest thrills that we have had, that people, not because of our work personally, but our little part of it, have felt 
I would have died if that bomb hadn't been dropped. And wherever Larry goes, where they know that this is, he's been a part of it, and it's a, a serviceman from our area, they say, thank you, thank you. So you're very proud of your husband's work? Very much so. Um, when you were at Los Alamos, did you know what your husband was working on? No. You didn't know it was a No, bomb? I didn't know. Even though I had the highest clearance, I did not know. Did you have any suspicion about what he was working no. on? No. So what did what was your reaction when you heard about the bombs being dropped on Hiroshima? Well, I knew something was interesting going on because when our daughter was just a few months old, Larry said, we're going to go to the edge of a mesa and we're going to watch for a flash. So I knew something was going on at that time. And that's when they... Um, when they set off the test, uh, what was it, at Almogordo. So you remember that? Uh, vividly. And we were sitting there for hours and nothing happened and we finally went back home and we realized later we heard that there was rain or something and it had to be delayed. But at that moment I realized something of importance was going on. So did you see the flash on the Mesa? No, we didn't. We we were not up that long. We we hoped to. It was supposed to have gone off earlier, but it didn't. But we had many wonderful friends from up there who we saw years afterwards. You know, we caught up with them in one city or another. We've lived like in seven cities since we're married, and it, it's it's been a wonderful experience. Some of our friends went on to get Nobel prizes, but like who? I can't think of his name for the life of me. I wrote it down there. Um, well, in the meantime, um, then, um, um, so what, what was your reaction when you heard that the bomb had been dropped? I was very solemn. I have to tell you, the day I will never forget it, Les Almas. All the GIs were out in all the Jeeps tooting horns and running up and down the hills and people uh, were up, you know, celebrating and in our house suddenly there were like 20 people drinking wine. That was VE Day. VE Day. Wonderful. The day the bomb was dropped, there was no, no hilarity on the hill. None of our friends got together. We were very solemn. Yes. Um, did you know Ed Hamill at Los Alamos? Oh, he was one of our best friends. They were our neighbors. They moved in after we did. They moved in. Larry was already working there. And he and his wife were, were two of our dearest friends, and we've kept up the relationship all through the years. He's still up there. So, and he worked on the plutonium as well? If you give me something artistic, I can tell you. Something scientific, mm -hmm. it's over my head. Um, um, were there a lot of Jewish scientists at Los Alamos? There were. There were. And I remember one year we had Passover there. And it was a gigantic room. I can't remember which room it was in. It was not at the in gigantic room. And we had a beautiful Passover Seder. And I think it was led by the army chaplain, but I'm not positive. But it was a very wonderful feeling, yes. Were there any other um, Jewish celebrations at Los Alamos that you can remember? Only personal ones, only personal ones. So there wasn't there wasn't much of a religious life or community at there. At well, the time. if if there was, we were not part of it. Okay. We were not part of it. Um, now, when you were in Chicago, your husband mentioned that you were the second person to see metallic to plutonium. That's right. Can, I'll never forget that day. Can can you can you tell us a little bit about it? I was taking dust samples. I was working for Health Physics. 
and either I was doing Larry's lab or as he said he might have invited me in and he said I want you to look down this telescope and I want you to remember this day I cannot tell you about it but I never want you to forget this day so you knew it was something special very special I have to tell you most of the women I know did not know what their husbands were working on it wasn't important and that may seem strange to you but we knew it was secret we and we went about our lives happily um, in one book I read that a lot of people felt like they were um, trapped. Tra trapped at Los Alamos of all the people I knew and I must have known close to a hundred that's not so that's not so we led our lives we were happy uh, one thing that really surprised me, I can't remember where it, when, it, when it happened, but I think towards the end of the war, we were given a little plot for a victory garden. Larry loved to, to put his hands in the ground. He, lo he loved to grow things. I think we grew tomatoes. What, now, what were you working on when you were at Chicago? It, uh, it, it's funny, I was a librarian before I got married in a rental library. We had those things in those days, I don't think we have them anymore. Um, in Chicago I got a job with the Treasury. It, it was a nondescript kind of a job. And I was only working there about three months when we left. But you mentioned something about taking dust samples? That was at Los Alamos. Oh, Los that Alamos. was with health physics. Okay. That was part of health physics. So, so was that was it at Los Alamos when you saw the metal metallic plutonium? It. it was. Okay. Yes, and that was at Los Alamos. Okay. Yeah. Um, were there any other restrictions that you can remember of life at Los Alamos? Were you allowed to go to Santa Fe? We were allowed. You know, it was a big trip. It was a big trip. Uh, when we wanted to order something, I remember trying to get baby clothes before Barbara was born. Everything was done through Sears and Montgomery Ward catalogs. I, I wouldn't go to Santa Fe to shop. Santa Fe in those days was a, a little like one lane street, you know, that's how I remember it. I, I don't remember it like the metropolis it is that I visited, you know, just a few years ago. It was just a little, a little place. Did you ever have any trouble getting things from catalogs? Yes, yes, everything, everything. If I ordered two dozen diapers, maybe I, I got a dozen. I remember the thrill that I had. My mother and dad sent up a crib and a, um, um, a little dresser, you know, for the newborn. One, one thing I have to tell you that would give everybody a laugh. One, one after you brought the baby home, we had a little scale. Well, I, I nursed her, and I had to put her on the scale before I nursed her and after I nursed her to see how much she got. Well, today's mother, that's, that's a scream, you know. But I, I remember these were part of the instructions we had in taking good care of a baby. Um, so your so your family sent you a crib, so they at least knew the P.O. Box sixteen sixty three address. They must have right because it, it, it did come to us. Okay. Um, what was a typical day like in Los Alamos? What time would you get up in the morning? These things are hard for me to remember. You know, Larry says we got up early and and we had like an eight to five job. That that's probably what we did. I, I, some things I, I can't remember cooking, but I must have cooked. I must have shopped. I, I know I hung up diapers. I can't remember for the life of me where I washed those diapers. Um, so did you mostly stay in on the base at Los Alamos? Always, always. Oh, my goodness. I remember one day 
Larry rented horses, and I think it was from the guards. And um, we hadn't ridden much back in Chicago. But this day, we, we got these two gigantic horses. It must have been at least 16 and a half hands apiece. And we're starting down the, the, this trail. And whoever fixed my stirrups, it wasn't tight enough. And suddenly, I'm saying, Larry, car clop. <laughs> so he picks me up, and he dusts me off. He says, well, I don't see any broken bones. Let's get back on. So we get, we get back on, and there was a trail from the mesa to a plateau below. I don't know how far that plateau was down below. It's quite a distance. And the trail down the side of the mesa was maybe two feet wide. No, we, we would never walk that in, 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 if we thought, you know, it was too dangerous. There's no handrails. But we're, we're going down, you know, having every confidence in the horse. And we get down to the plateau below, and all the cacti are in bloom. It was so beautiful. I cannot begin to tell you the colors. Remember, it was pretty, um, pretty uh, monotone up uh, at Los Alamos. And suddenly, here is this wonderful blaze of color. And uh, we, we just loved that day. And I had a kerchief on, and I could only take maybe six or seven cacti blooms. You know, and I took them back to Los Alamos, and I had it in a bowl, and I was so thrilled with it. That was a wonderful day. Um, what other things did you do for fun at Los Alamos? Well, we had a friend who had a car. That was Bob and Bet Betsy Sackheim. And um, I remember going to an Indian ruin. I can't remember the name, name, but I, re I remember we went to the ruin and there was an opening in the hill about this high. And there, there was a, a little step ladder going up to the, to the opening. It was ancient, ancient, ancient. Very thrilling, very thrilling. Did you go skiing or see any movies while you were there? I remember taking my daughter <clears throat> when she was in her carriage, you know, just three months old or so. There was a movie, um, it must have been run by the, the army in, in a big building, I can't remember. But I remember going to the movies th that night especially, you know. Were there any dances or any Yeah, concerts? there was a dance, not very many I, that I was invited to, but I remember going to one. Um, so um, how much longer after the war ended did you stay at Los Alamos? Not very long. Uh, Larry was lucky enough to be given a, a Battelle Fellow in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I think his boss put him in for that from Los Alamos, and he was awarded a Battelle Fellowship. And then he went on to graduate school. And I think he got out of graduate school with a doctorate about two years later. Do you, do you remember who Larry's boss was at Los Alamos? I, I'm trying my best to think of his name. I can't. It uh, was very special. Were you sad to leave Los Alamos? You know, I knew we were going on to a big adventure further, but when when we left Los Alamos, it was kind of towards sunset, and I, I cried. I cried because it had been a wonderful experience, and when I first went up there, I thought, this is so barren and everything. When I left, I, I felt entirely different, and I and I cried not not because uh, we were going somewhere else, but it it was just cheerful to leave. Um, did Did you ever return to Los Alamos? Yes, after we the war? have. Does it seem very different afterwards? Oh my God, we had one little mesa, 
when you go back to Los Alamos now, I don't know, is it three mesas or four? It's gigantic. I mean, <laughs> we had a little house. All our houses faced one street that I can remember. And now it's city. It's city. It's like Santa Fe. It's just grown. Do you remember the name of the street you lived on in Los Alamos? No. I don't know if it had a street. It was the main street, the main drag. Everybody went up and down that street going to the laboratories. Did um did you ever go on Bathtub Row where the top scientists lived? Um, you know, I never did. I never did. I, I heard a lot about it. And I met people afterwards who had lived there. Um, like who did you know afterwards? Well, several of our friends we, we met through the years and, you know, picked up. We became deep friends up at Los Alamos. And um, maybe we'd lose touch for years and we'd find each other in a strange city here and there. But there, there were several that we picked up and became friends again. It's, um, I can't think. This is really bothering me that I can't think of some of the important names. I just can't think right now. Um, did Did you know who General Groves was during the war? I didn't know him. No. Okay. No. Um, did you know? Did you have much contact with the the soldiers on at Los Alamos? Yes, we did. In fact, I think Arthur Rubenstein's son was a GI, and he became one of our friends. And uh, I can remember we had a couple of poker ga games at my house with some of the soldiers. And after the war, uh, when I was uh, waiting for Larry uh, in Chicago with my family, a whack came to visit. And, and there was an English couple that came to visit, and I can't remember. It wasn't the Tux, but I can't remember Popham. their... Which ones? Popham? Popham. No, it wasn't Popham, no. I can't remember his name. He was a scientist. He and his wife came to visit me in Chicago. Um, you told me that one of your neighbors was an Indian trader? One, the children. The daughter was a daughter Indian trader. And one day she, she said, hey, do you want some rugs? My father left four or five rugs here. And one was a beautiful black and gray and white hand-woven rug. I think it was called Gray Hills, but I'm not sure. And I thought, oh, I'd love this one. How much? And it was $45. And to this day, I have it. I think it's been appraised at about 1500 bucks. <laughs> I'm saying bucks a lot. That must be a Chicago expression. Um. So after, how did the Manhattan Project affect you and your husband's life after the war was over? Did it open up new opportunities for your husband and for yourself? My husband is so creative and so imaginative that he has at least 42 patents and I don't know how many, how many awards and so forth. And I want to put in that about 40 years ago, he ran a hydrogen, what? Hydrogen fuel cell. Union Carbide and General Motors got together and they needed something that would work without gas. And, and Larry developed this hydrogen fuel cell. General Motors put it in a car, a truck, and it ran up and down Park Avenue for miles and miles and miles. And eventually, that fuel cell is now in the Smithsonian. Our life has always been very full. Larry's always done something wonderful. We, we've lived in interesting places. We've met interesting people. Do you have any other stories about your husband's work that you would like to share? About his work? He did a lot of work with semiconductors, is that right? I, I can tell you, uh, 
the, the only ones that I'm interested in ones I can pronounce, <laughs> like, <laughs> like hydrogen fuel cells, or, or silicon, where he is a uh, considered one of seven pioneers. There's a mural down in Silicon Valley with his picture on it, and he's considered one of seven pioneers in the field. That's terrific. Otherwise, he makes wonderful daughters. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I think, as, as I say, w one of the greatest things that has come out of our work has been the emotional response from people who were in the war, who saw the horrors of war, who were in the fighting, and who thought they were on troop ships going to be killed. I think this is the lasting impression I will ever have of the atomic bomb. Um, do you have any other any other stories about the Manhattan Project that you would like to share from your time at Los Alamos or Chicago? Oh, so many things happen. I, I remember we were up in the hills somewhere. I can't remember where it was. And I think the Rio Grande, it, it seems inconceivable to me, but I crossed a creek by foot and I kept thinking, this is the, I think this is the Rio Grande. I, it can't not be, but maybe it was. And all around were Indian arrowheads. And I must have picked up two dozen Indian heroids. And I thought to myself, someday I will research this and find out what happened up here. There, there, there were so many things that happened. I remember one day, maybe it was the second Christmas we were there, uh, our neighbor and Larry, it was snow, and Larry, they went to cut down a Christmas tree. And as they came back to the house, I see these two men, you know, and it's snowing, and they're carrying this beautiful evergreen. And I'm thinking, this is what pictures are made of. This was a memory. Do you remember any funny or amusing stories that you would like to share? It seems like things funny were always happening. I, I can't think of anything quickly. Um, when, when did your husband tell you about what his work in the Manhattan Project had involved working on the plutonium? The night, the night before the bomb was dropped, he said, listen to Winchell tomorrow. He was very serious. He'd been working all night. And he came home in the morning and he said, listen to Winchell, Walter Winchell. And uh, that, that was the first time we knew, I knew that he had been working on an atomic bomb. Was, was he, what was his reaction, do you remember? He was so tired. He just wanted to go to bed. He was, he'd, he'd been working all night and he, he, he was beat, he was beat. And, and as they say, VE Day, there was tremendous jubilation on the hill. The day the bomb was dropped and after that, it was sober, quiet. No people coming to over to have a glass of wine. Very sober reaction from all of us. Um, when did you find out that he'd worked on the plutonium? He, he probably told me soon after that. So are you, you're very proud of your husband's work um, throughout his career? Whatever he worked on, yes, absolutely. It was nice to feel like pioneers. I, I guess I, I would say that afterwards when I thought about it. it. It was nice feeling to be pioneers, you know, and new breakthroughs.